he said, without concepts, there can be no thought, and without analogies, there can be no concepts. In a, in a Santa Fe presentation, you said that it should be one of the mantras of AI. Yes. And that you also yourself said, uh, how to form and fluidly use concept is the most important open problem in AI. Yes. How to form and fluidly use concepts is the most important open problem in AI. So let's, uh, what is a concept and what is an analogy? A concept is in some sense a, a fundamental unit of thought. So say we have a, a concept uh, of uh, a dog, okay? And a concept is embedded in a, a whole space of concepts so that there's certain concepts that are closer to it or farther away from it. Are these concepts, are they really like fundamental, like we mentioned innate, almost like axiomatic, like very basic, and then there's other stuff built on top of it? Or yeah. does this include everything? Is Are there complicated, like? You can certainly have form new concepts. Right, I guess that's the question I'm asking. Yeah. Can you form new concepts that are combina complex combinations of other concepts? Yes, absolutely. And that's kind of what we, we do in yeah. learning. And then what's the role of analogies in that? So analogy structure? is when you recognize that one situation is essentially the same as another situation. And essentially is kind of the key word there because it's not the same. So if I say, um, last week I did a podcast interview mm -hmm. in actually like three days ago mm -hmm. <laughs> in Washington, D.C. And that situation was very similar to this situation, although it wasn't exactly the same. You know, it was a different person mm -hmm. sitting across from me. We had different kinds of microphones. Uh, the questions were different. The building was different. Uh, there's all kinds of different things, but really it was analogous. Mm -hmm. um, or I can say, so so, so doing a podcast interview, that's kind of a concept. It's a new yes, concept. concept. You know, I uh, never had that concept before <laughs> <laughs> this year, essentially. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and I can make an analogy with it, like being interviewed for a news article mm -hmm. in a newspaper. And I can say, well, you kind of play the same role that mm -hmm. the the newspaper reporter played. It's not exactly the same because mm -hmm. maybe they actually emailed me some written questions rather than talking. And the writing, the written questions uh, play the you know are analogous to your spoken questions. And you know, there's there's just all kinds of similarities. and this somehow probably connects to conversations you have over Thanksgiving dinner, just general conversations. You could, there's like a thread you can probably take that just stretches out in all aspects of life that connect to this podcast. I mean, sure, conversations between humans. Sure, and if, and if um, I go and tell a friend of mine about this podcast interview, my friend might say, "Oh, the same thing happened to me." You know, let's say you know you ask me some really hard question, and I have trouble answering it. My friend could say. The same thing happened to me, but it was like, it wasn't a podcast interview. It wasn't, uh, uh, it was a completely different situation. And yet my friend is seeing essentially this, the same thing. You know, we say that very fluidly, the same thing happened to me. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially or, the same thing. Right? But we don't even say that, right? right, right. We just they say the same imply thing. it, yes. Yeah. And the view that kind of went, went into, say, copycat, that, that whole thing is that 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 act of saying the same thing happened to me is making an analogy. And in some sense, that's what underlies all of our concepts. Why do you think analogy making that you're describing is so fundamental to cognition? Like it seems like it's the main element action of what we think of as cognition. Yeah, so it can be argued that all of this generalization we do of concepts and recognizing concepts in different situations um, is done by analogy. That that's, every time I'm recognizing that, say, 
you're a person. That's by analogy, because I have this concept of what person is, and I'm applying it to you. And uh, every time I recognize a new situation, like one of the things I talked about it, in the book was the, the, the concept of walking a dog, mm -hmm. that that's actually making an analogy because all of that, you know, the details are very different. So, so, no, so reasoning could be reduced down to essentially analogy making. So all the things we think of as like, uh, yeah, like you said, perception. So what's perception is taking raw sensory input and it's somehow integrating into our, our, our understanding of the world, updating the understanding and all of that has just this giant mess of analogies that are being made. I think so, yeah. If you could just linger on it a little bit, like what what do you think it takes to engineer a process like that for us in our artificial systems? We need to understand better, I think, how how we do it, how humans do it. And it comes down to internal models, I think. You know, people talk a lot about mental models that concepts are mental models that I, I can, in my head, I can do a simulation mm -hmm. of a situation like walking a dog. Right. And that there, there's some work in psychology that promotes this idea that all of concepts are really mental simulations. That whenever you encounter a concept or situation in the world, or you read about it or whatever, you do some kind of mental simulation mm -hmm. that allows you to predict what's going to happen, to, to develop expectations of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of structure I think we need, is that kind of mental model that, and the, in, in our brains, somehow these mental models are very much interconnected. Again, so a lot of stuff we're talking about are essentially open problems, right? So yeah. if I ask a question, I don't mean to, uh, that you would know the answer, only right. just hypothesizing. But how big do you think is the, the, the network graph data structure of concepts that's in our head? Like if we're trying to build that ourselves, like... It's, we take it, that's one of the things we take for granted, we think. I mean, that's why we take common sense for granted. We think common sense is trivial. But how big of a th thing of concepts is un that underlies what we think of as common sense, for example? Yeah, I don't know. And I, I'm not, I don't even know what units to measure it in. <laughs> and you say, how big that's is it? That's beautifully put, right? <laughs> what, uh... But, you know, we have, uh, you know, it's really hard to know. We have... Uh, what, 100 billion neurons or something, I don't know. Uh, and they're connected via trillions of synapses. And there's all this chemical processing going on. There's just a lot of capacity for <laughs> stuff. And their information's encoded in different ways in the brain. It's encoded in uh, ke chemical interactions. It's encoded in ele electric like firing and firing rates. And, and nobody really knows how it's encoded. But it just seems like there's a huge amount of capacity. So I think it's it's huge. It's just enormous. And it's amazing how much stuff we know. Yeah. And, and if we're, <laughs> but we know and not just know like facts, but it's all integrated into this thing that we can make analogies with. Yes. There's a dream of semantic web. And there's, there's a lot of dreams from expert systems of building giant knowledge bases. Do you see a hope for these kinds of approaches of building, of converting Wikipedia into something that could be used in analogy making? Uh, sure. And I think people have, have made some progress along those lines. I mean, people have been working on this for a long time. But the problem is, and this I think was is is the problem of common sense. Like people have been trying to get these common sense networks. Here at MIT, there's this concept net project, right? Uh, but the problem is that, as I said, most of the knowledge that we have is in, invisible to us. It's not in Wikipedia. <laughs> it's yeah. very basic things about, you know, intuitive physics, intuitive psychology, intuitive metaphysics, all that stuff. If you were to create a website 
that described intuitive physics, intuitive psychology, would it be bigger or smaller than Wikipedia? What do you think? I guess described to whom? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's it, no, it, that's it, really good. I, you it's know, exactly right. Yeah, that's a hard question because you know, how do you represent that knowledge? Is the question right? right. I can certainly write down F equals M A and all of Newton's laws, and a lot of physics can be deduced from that. Uh, uh, but that's probably not the best representation of that knowledge for for doing uh, the kinds of reasoning we want a machine to do. So, so I don't know. It's 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 impossible to say now. <laughs> and people, you know, the projects like there's a famous the famous Psych project, psych project right? That yeah. D D Doug Douglas Lenat did. That was I trying think still going. I think it's still going, and yeah. it's the the idea was to try and encode all of common sense knowledge, including all this invisible knowledge, in some kind of logical representation. And it just never, I think, could do any of the things that he was hoping it could do, because that's just the wrong approach. Of course, that's what they always say, you know, and 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 then the history books will say, well. The Psych Project finally found a breakthrough in uh, 2058 or something. And it, it, you know, we're so much progress has been made in just a few decades that yeah, uh, it could who be. knows what the next breakthroughs will be. It could be. It's certainly a compelling notion what the Psych Project stands for. I think Lennett was one of the earliest people to say common sense is what is we important. need. That's what we need. All this like expert system stuff that is not gonna get you to AI. You need common sense. And he basically gave up his whole uh, academic career to to go pursue that. And I, I totally admire that, but I, I think that the approach itself will not in 2020 or 2040 <laughs> 50, or wherever. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think is wrong successful? with the approach? What kind of approach would might be successful? Well, Again, knew that. nobody knows the answer, right? If I knew that. You know, what, one of my talks, uh, one of the people in the audience, this is a public lecture, one of the people in the audience said, what AI companies are you investing in? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, Investment I'm, advice? Okay. I'm a college professor for one thing, <laughs> so I don't have a lot of extra funds to invest. But also, like, no one knows what's going to work in AI, right? right? That's the problem. Let me ask another impossible question in case you have a sense. In terms of data structures that will store this kind of information, do you think they've been invented yet, both in hardware and software, or is something else needs to be? Are we totally, you know? I think something else has to be invented. I that's my guess. Is the breakthroughs that's most promising? Would that be in hardware or in software? Do you well, think we can get far with the current computers? Or do we need to uh, do something that you... I see what you're saying. I don't know if Turing computation is going to be sufficient. It's Probably. Sufficient. I would guess it will. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any reason why we need anything else. But so, so in that sense, we have invented the hardware we need, but we just need to make it faster and bigger. <laughs> right. And we need to figure out the right algorithms and, and the right uh, sort of architecture. Turing... It, that's a very mathematical notion. When we try, have to build intelligence, it's an, now an engineering notion where you throw all that stuff. Well, I guess I guess it, it is a it's, it is a question. The, 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 people have brought up this question, you know, and, and when you asked about like, is our current hardware will will our current hardware work? Well, t Turing computation says that like our current hardware is in principle a Turing machine, right? Yes. It, it, so all we have to do is make it faster and bigger. But there have been people like Roger Penrose, if you might remember that he said Turing machines cannot produce intelligence because intelligence requires continuous valued numbers. I mean, that was sort of my reading of his yeah. <laughs> argument uh, and quantum mechanics and right. what, what else, whatever, you, you know. But I don't see any evidence for that, that we need new computation paradigms. 
But I don't know if we're, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to scale up our current approaches to programming these computers. 